Good morning. My name is Brad Olson. I'm the head Jesus follower here, and welcome to worship at Loveland United Methodist Church. Today we are continuing our series on Philippians. We're in the second of a four-week series on Philippians, and so our focus is on joy. In a book called The Way of Faith, um, the author describes a time when a lady who was living in London was approached by a man who said, I just want to thank you. And she said, thank me for what? And he says, well, until I retired, I was a ticket taker at the train station, and every day you would come through and you'd have a smile on your face. And it got to me to wondering, why does that lady always have a smile on her face? And then one day you came through with a Bible. And I thought, maybe that's the reason why this lady has a smile on her face. And so I got myself a Bible, and I started reading the Bible, and I accepted Christ into my life, and now I've got a smile on my face. Isn't that cool? We're going to explore what it means to be a people of joy. We're in the second chapter of the letter to the Philippians. There are some things that we thought you ought to know about things that are going on in the life of this church, and then to start us out with the call to worship, I'm going to turn things over to Lisa. Good morning, everybody. If you'll open your bulletin, take out your connection card, I just wanted to um, remind you that you have this as a way of letting us know that you're here today. You can fill it out manually, or you can get techie and use the QR code, which is also printed on the back of your pews. You just point your phone at it. And one QR code is good for the entire um, group that you're with. You can just put everybody's name on that. And if you have any contact information, you can use that to update so that we ha get that all put together in the office and everything. Got some highlights for you this morning. On your happenings card, you'll notice that the Pathfinders is up and running again, and it is not too late to join. They are doing a study on the book of Daniel. It sounds very exciting. There's two offerings of that. One starts at 9.30 in the morning on Tuesdays, and the other one starts at 6 p.m. on Tuesdays. And you've heard me talk about this every week, but we're getting nearer to the start date um, for our all-church study on The Chosen, and this morning I have a trailer to show you, so I'm excited about that. <clears throat> My son, they've run out of wine. Mother. My time has not yet come. If not now, when? <laughs> I'm ready, Father. It has begun. What has? Miracles. Signs and wonders. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You have experienced a miracle, Mary. I saw him. It was incredible. Our Father. Our Father. Who art in heaven. Who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. The man has a following. He's a rogue who answers to no one. You asked me before if I knew his name. Now everyone knows his name. And I fear for his safety. Throw this down for a catch. Do you think that impossible things can happen? That overturn the laws of nature. <laughs> that cannot be explained. Rise. <laughs> Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. This is different. Get used to different. My whole life, I have wondered if I would see the 
one way and now I am completely different and the thing that happened in between was him I cannot say enough about this series it is fabulous I hope you guys join in the study there's kits in the lobby if you plan to take part in the study either here or if you're gonna do it by yourself at home please take a kit with you when you leave today um, also, I wanted to remind you, we have our church picnic coming up, and there is information on that in the happenings as well, as also a way to sign up would be to write picnic on your connection card, or um, picnic on the QR code also, and the United Methodist Women, busy as always with stuff um, looks like it says that they're meeting for the first time in almost two years that's coming up this uh, Thursday the 7th at 10 and then the festival of sharing is still going on and it looks like we need to have our stuff back by 9 26 so and you'll see some of the bags up front okay now we're gonna go ahead and get to the call to worship it's interactive you'll see it on the screen behind me or it's also in your bulletin Blessed be the Lord who has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and shield, in whom my heart trusts. So I am helped, and my heart exalts. With my song, I give thanks to the Lord. The Lord is the strength of the people, the saving refuge of his anointed. O save your people, and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd, and carry them forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And can you please stand and we'll all sing together.
people through the centuries have tried to answer the question, what do I believe? And one of the most traditional and well-known answers is what we call the Apostles' Creed. Will you join with me in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you, choir. As a people of prayer, I'd like to invite you to join together with me in our congregational prayer. It's either printed in your bulletin or on the screens. Let us pray. Loving God, who speaks to us through your scriptures and the collective wisdom of your people throughout the ages, help us to hear anew what you would speak to us this day. For your word is always fresh, a message of life and hope 
in the world that needs to know and heed your will. Through Christ, the living word, and your spirit of illumination, who with you is the truth that sets us free. Amen. is from the ninth chapter of Mark, verses 30 through 37. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. My name is Sharon. Welcome to our children's moment. I brought something very special with me. This is, it's really, it's really heavy and it's kind of falling apart, but this is a family Bible that we have. This belonged to my great grandfather, I'm sorry, my great great grandfather who came to the United States from Ireland. The, the first edition of this Bible was in 1609, it was printed in 1609. This I'm guessing is early to mid 1800s. Um, part of it's in Latin. It's um, a Catholic Bible. It has pictures for family, family portraits in the back or places for it, I should say. The page that has the actual date is long since gone. But it's a beautiful keepsake to have. It's wonderful to have the memories, the history. What made me think about this for our children's moment today is the Sunday school lesson is based on the book of Ezra. We've been talking about how God's people were all taken into captivity, into slavery, everything they had destroyed. Well, 70 years has passed, and God has been promising them that he would let them go home, and that's exactly what takes place. The captives get to go back home. King Cyrus has his heart softened by God, and he says, all of the Israelites that want to return to their homeland may, and we are going to send gifts with you. You have, basically, he said, you have our blessing to go back and, and rebuild your cities, your towns. Well, what reminded me of a family history was when they did this, they went back, and, and not all of them, mind you. Some of them became very comfortable in Babylon. A little side note for us there today, right? But the ones who went back also went back for the purpose of starting to rebuild the temple to worship God. And an interesting thing happened. There were celebrations when the foundation was completed. They created the foundation and a place for the Holy of Holies where God's presence would ultimately meet with them. The young people were filled with joy and celebrating, and the older people were sad and mourning, and they're saying, oh, if you only remembered, if you only knew what it had been like. Do you have people in your family, older people in your family that said, back in my day, this is how it was, or this is why it was better, or, this is what I remember. And that's exactly what it reminded me of. I wonder if that's one of the first times in the Bible that that happened, was that, well, when I was young, this is how it was. But the people truly mourned that that original temple where they worshipped was gone. Now the story continues. It doesn't happen overnight that they rebuild the temple. But what we see are people rededicated to God. And I feel like that happens in our families as well, with things like family Bibles and history and the connections we have through the generations. And Jesus always, through all of it, 
He is the connection. It's more than just the words on the page, but Jesus is what that temple pointed to. Jesus is the reason God restored his people. Jesus is the reason for everything in our lives. See you next time. Thank you, Ms. Sharon, and good morning. My name is Emily. I'm the worship leader here at LUMC. Thank you, as always, band, Billy and Rob. Uh, and today, our topic is joy hanging in the balance. Have you guys had some trouble finding your joy lately? You can be honest. I'm seeing a couple of nods. OK, I'm not going to call anybody out. <laughs> I think sometimes, as Christians, we fall into a trap of perfection, of thinking that because we're Christians and because we have Christ in our lives, we should be joyful all the time. And that's not the case, because we're humans. It's OK to be not OK. It's OK to feel the yuck. And usually we hear, leave your troubles at the door, but I'd like to invite you to bring them in, because that's the point of worship, is to lay them down and thank God for the good that we have in our lives. And as we lay down those troubles, we'll receive joy in return. I'd like to invite you to stand, uh, but please worship however you're comfortable.
to the fragrance of spring. Every creature you
Our second scripture reading is Philippians 2, 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Joy. Not because everything's going our way, but because when troubles do come, they are better faced with joy. To better understand what joy is all about, we are in the second of a four-week series on the letter to the Philippians. Last week we started and we focused on chapter one. Today I'd like to spend some time focusing on chapter two. Next week I'd like to spend some time focusing on chapter three, and then we'll wrap it up while well, you get the idea. My hope is to say something that will get you thinking, boy, I'd really like to look at that a little bit more carefully. And then you'll uh, look for the letter to the Philippians. It's just past halfway through the New Testament, right in there between Ephesians and Colossians. I don't point this out very often, and so I thought this would be a good chance to do that. Every week in our bulletin, we have what we call next steps, and these are a series of questions that if you have a thought, you can just write a note to yourself there. That's the intent of that. So then when you say, I should have gone and looked that up. What was I thinking? 
you'd have this in front of you and maybe that'll give you a little bit more direction in, in where to look. Last week, I made the point that Philippians is the Apostle Paul's letter or epistle of joy. The reason that I say that is because 14 times in the letter, Paul mentions either joy or rejoicing and says things like rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It's a recurring theme in this letter to the Philippians. I also said that most people think it was written around 62 AD. Why is that important? Well, because the Apostle Paul is traditionally thought to have been, to been martyred in Rome around 64 AD. So this was right towards the end of his life where he's either on trial or waiting to be put on trial. And it cost him his life. And as he's in the midst of those circumstances, what does he think about but joy, joy. How do we have that kind of of joy. Um, and so we're looking at this second chapter of the letter to the Philippians. I've suggested that, let me talk a little bit about why letters were written in those days. They were written by a particular person inspired by the Holy Spirit and usually for a particular reason. Either there was an issue going on that they wanted to speak to or some circumstance that they wanted to have some wisdom around. Most people wouldn't have been able to read in those days, and so they generally, these letters would have been read when the community gathered together. Letters weren't easy to write in those days. They weren't just like typing out an email. They would have taken some energy. I've said that the reason that the letter to the Philippians was written was probably as a way of saying thank you. The church in Philippi, when they heard about what Paul was going through, they took up an offering and they sent it along with a guy, remember Epaphroditus, to deliver it. And then Epaphroditus stayed with the Apostle Paul to take care of some of his needs. But I got to wondering, might there have been another reason for the Apostle Paul to have written this letter? And I think that there is. And here's my thinking. Travel with me now to the end of the letter to the Philippians. There it talks about some kind of a conflict that two ladies in the church were having, Euodia and Syncathy. We don't know what the nature of this conflict was, but we know that they must have believed, each of them, that they were right, and maybe they were even trying to convince other people that they were right. Whatever was going on, we know that it was important enough that the Apostle Paul mentioned it in this letter. Can't you just see them in church on a Sunday morning? They were probably sitting on opposite sides of the room because they didn't really want to be associating with each other. And then this letter is read and it mentions them. And can't you just kind of see them sinking down in their seat? <laughs> Whatever it is, is so important that it has made its way two months' journey to the Apostle Paul in Rome on trial for his life. And he thinks it's important enough to mention, but not important enough to mention what it's all about. What that tells me is it probably wasn't a doctrinal disagreement. Because the Apostle Paul in other places didn't have any, um, seemed very free about commenting on doctrinal issues. So if this had been a di disagreement over the nature of God or the person of Jesus or living in the Holy Spirit, I'm sure the Apostle Paul would have felt free to, to say some words on this. So this was probably more of a matter of different styles of ministry. Can you imagine that? Two people disagreeing over something in church. It's been my experience, you get two people together and they're going to have some kind of a disagreement. Never experienced that in any churches I've served. Well, yes, I have. <laughs> I'm going to be honest here. One church I served, we had a lot of foot traffic through the church in the course of a week. And so somebody got this idea, let's put a soda machine in the church. Actually, that wasn't the difficult part. We did a little research and found out it's fairly easy to put a soda machine in a church. All you've got to do is call the right people. And we got approval to put the soda ma or pop machine in, whichever soda or pop. 
Then we got to the crucial decision that has divided people for decades, and this is what we fought about. Coke or Pepsi? All right, here is another of the disagreements that churches that I've served have had over the years is how are you supposed to do communion? Are you supposed to do it with a common loaf and a common cup or individual little cups? And boy, if you want to get an argument going, that, start that conversation. There are some others that are probably coming to mind for you. Um, my favorite, though, was when I was serving two churches in Bath, Indiana, just down the road, there was a right foot Baptist church and a left foot Baptist church. They were doing a foot washing during um, Holy Week one, one year, and they couldn't decide on whether to wash the left foot or the right foot. Congregation divided, and now, or there was then, a left foot Baptist church and a right foot Baptist church. When a couple comes to me and wants to get married, I always meet with them a couple of times before they get married, and one of the questions I always ask is the question, how do you deal with disagreements? Do you have rules for fighting? And sometimes the couple looks at me and says, oh, we're so in love, we never argue over anything. And you know what I say usually in my head, sometimes out loud? Oh, you're either being not, not being honest with me or you're not being honest with yourselves. Because anytime you get two people in the same room, you're going to disagree about something, right? So Euodia and Syncathy were disagreeing about something. Now, you may be saying to yourself, but Brad, we're only in the second chapter of Philippians and you're talking about the fourth chapter. So what does any of this have to do with the second chapter. And here's where I'm going with this. I think the second chapter of Philippians was written to address this problem going on between these two ladies. Now, there's no answer that is a one-size-fits-all when it comes to disagreements, but do you want to know what the Apostle Paul's advice to them is, if I'm right? He says, if then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others, bless you, as better than yourselves. I think what he's saying to these two ladies is remember that each of you, the other person, is a beloved daughter of God. Treat each other with respect. And your faith is likely seen not in whether you disagree or agree on everything, but how you resolve those disagreements. And then he turns to a hymn. Do you know how I know it's a hymn? You may know this about your Bibles, but most of the Bible is written in prose, and sentences and paragraphs, but sometimes it's broken out in meter. That's usually a sign that what's being written is either a poem or a song. So if I could speak this in Greek, there probably would be a rhythm to what's being said. You want to know how this song went? Here's the way that the song that he quotes goes. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who Though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God so highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and even under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. Don't you wish we had the music to that still? I bet that made quite a hymn. All right, let's do a little bit of Bible study here. Remember, we're in 62 A.D., sometimes there's this idea that pops up every so often that as the church came progressed, things were added into the faith. And one of the things that is sometimes said is that one of the things that was added into the faith was this idea of the divinity of Christ. That early on the church believed in the humanity of Christ, but as time went on we developed the idea of the divinity of Christ. Now, remember, this is 62 AD and this is a hymn, so it's probably, or a song, so it's probably already been around for a while. And do you 
hear what's said in this song? It talks about how from the very beginning, Jesus was one with God, and then God took on human form in the person of Jesus, and that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So here even 10 years before what we think was when the earliest of the Gospels was written, we hear already singing of how God and Christ are one in the same, and how Jesus, God in Jesus, humbled himself, taking on human form and giving us for, for us an example of what a life of humble service looked like. We get ourselves in trouble when we get to thinking too highly of ourselves, don't we? When we get to thinking too highly of ourselves, then joy hangs in the balance, and nothing will rob that joy quicker than being in conflict with another person. Earlier this summer, I got to thinking pretty highly of myself. I was trying to fix some things around the house and had take on, taken on a couple of projects that I had been able to actually fix, which is rare. And so I was thinking, all right, I can do about anything. So I started looking at other things around the house that I could fix. And one of the problems that we had is we have a keypad outside of our garage door. That you, you know, you push in your garage code and it opens the garage door opener. And so I thought, all right, let's take that on. It's not a big deal. We never use the keypad, but it doesn't work, so I'm going to fix it. I thought it's probably just a battery. So I changed the battery. Didn't help. So then I thought, how expensive can those keypads be? So we decided to replace the keypad, went out and got another one. The problem was that the keypad didn't synchronize with the garage door opener. Apparently the garage door opener was too, too old. All right, I could have just let it go at that. The problem is, in trying to get the two synchronized, I opened up the code on the garage door opener, and somehow every other house in the neighborhood managed to get their garage door opener synchronized with our garage door. So anytime anybody came or went from their house, our garage door went up and down. <laughs> two o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock in the morning, the garage door is going up and down. So I ended up having to replace the whole garage door opener just because I thought there was a battery that needed to be replaced in the keypad on the outside. We get ourselves in trouble when we get to thinking too highly of ourselves, don't we? Christ humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. So what am I trying to say, or what is Paul trying to say in the second chapter of the letter to the Philippians? I think he's trying to say that true joy, lasting joy, happens through humble service. True joy happens through humble service. And he uses an, as an example... Epaphroditus. Remember him? He was the one who brought the offering from Philippi to the Apostle Paul. We find out that when he got to Rome, he got sick. And not just a little sick, but really sick. Sick to the point of death. And the Apostle Paul uses that as an example of somebody who is willing to risk his life to serve in ministry. And that brings the Apostle Paul joy. Joy is found in humble service. This is the kind of God that we worship. Jesus, through his ministry, would give us that example. He would say, those who humble themselves will be exalted, and those who exalt themselves will be humble. He said, the first will be last, and the last will be first. He said, if you want to make your life, life right with the Lord, there's a prayer that you need to learn to pray, and it goes like this. Father, have mercy on me a sinner. He said in the scripture that we read a little bit earlier, if anyone wants to be master of all, they must be servant of all. And in the highest example of what greatness, true greatness looks like, he knelt down on a knee and started washing his disciples' feet. True joy comes in humble service. I saw an example of this, I think, earlier this week on the news. Did you see this story about a doctor by the name of Lauren, Dr. Lauren Walinski? He's a pediatric oncologist. He happens to be married to the director of the CDC, so that's why the story first caught my attention. The story was about how 21 years ago, 
his very first cancer patient was a young lady by the name of Kate Franklin. He says he remembers how difficult it was to tell her family that their daughter had leukemia. What her mother's response was, though, is we're going to fight this thing and we will invite you to her wedding. And so they hunkered down and they fought this. Dr. Walensky fought the leukemia with everything that he had. And not only did he do everything medically possible, but he also invested in this girl's life. They became good friends. At every major event that happened in her life, Dr. Walensky was there. And so when she was about 10 years old and starting to think about what she wanted to be when she grew up, you know what she decided she wanted to be? A doctor. Because of the example of this good friend and caring doctor that she had, Dr. Walensky. Now, you may be wondering, all right, so why was she in the news on Monday? She had been accepted into medical school and was getting her white coat. And you know what the first thing she did when she got the white coat on? She took a selfie of herself and guessed who she texted it to. She said in her text, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. Do you know what Dr. Walensky was feeling at that moment? Joy, joy from years spent agonizing in humble service. He actually said, this moment ranks my wedding day, birth of my children, and this moment. All right, let me see if I can leave you with some closing thoughts. When we're in the midst of conflict, if we can remember Philippians, if we can look not at our own interests but to the interests of the other person, if we look at them and consider them as better than ourselves, if we can do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, if we can let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, then we will find joy. Will you join with me in prayer? Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, there are so many sad and troublesome things that face us in the world today, which we too often cause our hearts to become weighed down with difficulties and doubts. But we pray that your joy would fill our hearts and strengthen our souls, and that times of joy and laughter would replace those seasons of weeping and hardship. We pray that in Christ we may be clothed with strength and dignity, wisdom and grace, and that we may be enabled to laugh in the storms and to not fear the future, knowing that our times are in your hands. You've promised to draw near to each one of us and be with us in every circumstance of life that may come our way. And so we pray that your joy and your laughter may flow through us to others who are facing similar difficulties and hardships, and that together we maintain an ever-deepening trust in you as we look for your day to return and to take us to be with yourself. We ask this in Jesus' name, who taught the disciples once and teaches us still to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you stand and join together in our closing hymn?
our mission to connect faith with life, there is an offering box just to the left of the door as you leave. There also is a button on our webpage, lovelandumc.org, where you can give electronically. Thank you for your generous giving. Let me tell you how this study of Philippians will end. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. To God the Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So you may, may you go from here guarded by the peace of God and giving glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Stay safe and be well. Go in peace to serve the Lord and the people of God all said, Amen. Amen.